ask that you would prepare the hearts of those who are listening. Father, to receive all that you have. And I ask, Father God, that the Holy Spirit would give me supernatural strength <clears throat> to stand here with boldness, uh, to speak the truth in love, not with condemnation, but with conviction in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I'd like for you to raise your hand and keep your hand raised um, while I ask you a series of questions. Raise your hand if you have ever intentionally or unintentionally hurt or offended someone and keep your hand raised and if your hand isn't raised raise your hand if you have ever felt hurt or experienced conflict by somebody else or if you have felt church hurt or know of someone who has felt church hurt so look around and by a show of hands it is safe to say that everyone has felt hurt or has experienced conflict in one form or fashion. Would you all agree? Well, unfortunately, we have many relationships, and this term, church hurt, seems to be common. How many have heard of that, church hurt? But what's interesting is that church hurt isn't new. And the hurt that happens inside the church is no more than the hurt that happens outside of the church. The same amount of hurt that's happening inside of the church is happening outside of the church. Now, as Christians, we have this notion that as a believer, you shouldn't be treating me this way. And while that is true, as a believer, we shouldn't be responding to conflict a certain way. But most of us, as believers, don't respond to conflict the way the word says. We respond to conflict out of our flesh. Would you agree? And because of that, we get what we call church hurt, or conflict, or offended, or you hurt my feelings all because we mishandle conflict. It's interesting that Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing shall offend them and make them stumble. <laughs> That's none of us. <laughs> Think about that. Great peace are those that love the law. Well, we love God. We may not all love the law, but we love God. But nothing offends me and I won't stumble. Well, that's not true because everything offends us. And we stumble, which means when I get offended, I stumble. So when I take offense of something you do, I cuss you out and go off. That causes me to stumble. Well, if I didn't take offense to what you do, I wouldn't stumble. So why is it that we stumble? See, the fact is that you may not be able to stop offensive things from happening, but you are able to stop being hurt by them. You're not going to be able to stop people from offending you, but you can stop being hurt by the offense. That's easier said than done. That is easier said than done. And so many of us stumble in this area, but if we want to see change, then we can seek the scripture, allow the Holy Spirit to change us and to work on us in this area. And our pastor used to say, conflict can lead to deeper intimacy if handled properly. People don't think conflict can lead to intimacy, but it can. It can lead to a deeper level of intimacy if handled properly. Our daughter is taking this, um, well, she just finished taking a public speaking class in school. Um, she goes to a career and technical academy, and this was a required class. She was really mad to see this class on her school schedule. She was like, why do I have public speaking? I don't want to do this. Well, when we attended orientation, what they explained to us was that most people are afraid of two things in life, fear 
and speaking in public. I'm sorry, deaf and speaking in public. And they said, we want to help them with speaking in public. We can't help them with deaf, but we can help them with speaking in public. Well, because they're a career and technical academy, um, their philosophy is um, we need to be able to teach kids to be able to speak their opinion, but respectfully listen to somebody else's opinion. To respectfully listen to somebody else's differences by watching their body language and being able to respond back with the way they feel in a respectful manner. Now, listening to that actually brought tears to my eyes because I was thinking most adults don't do that. We can't listen to each other and respect that we have differences. Our body language while we're listening is like, mm. So it got me thinking. The Bible does give us clear direction on how to handle conflict. And the only success in conflict is addressing it. And while the Bible, which we're going to see in just a few minutes about how to address conflict, there's three things we need to do before we even start addressing conflict. And this new series that we're starting is called Overcoming Hurt and Addressing Conflict. And I want to walk us through that. But there's three things we need to do before we even consider over addressing, over, um, addressing conflict. There's three things we need to do. Number one, that is to pray. First, we need to pray and know who our enemy is. Okay, we can't be ignorant to the enemy's devices. We need to know who we're fighting. Because the enemy will use the one you love to get under your skin. Okay, 2 Corinthians 2.11 in the NIV says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not aware of his schemes. So we need to outsmart the enemy. If you know that your husband is having a bad day at work and he kind of got short with you, don't be so quick to take offense. Recognize, you know what, he's a little under pressure at work. Let me not take offense here. Let me pray. <laughs> Remember, our battle is not against each other. We all like to say the struggle is we all like to say the struggle is real. The struggle is so real. Ephesians 6.12 in the NIV says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So when you say, that struggle against my parents is real. That struggle against my husband is real. Well, the struggle is not against your husband. For the struggle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. The enemy will use the people we love. So once we recognize that, we can outsmart the devil. Number two, take accountability for your actions first. So before we start going off and letting the person know what they did wrong to us, we just need to let them know what they did. First stop, pray. Second, take accountability of your own actions. What could I have possibly done differently? Is there something I did in this situation? First, take accountability for your own actions before addressing the conflict with somebody else. First, take ownership for your own action. Is there something I could have done differently? Am I possibly taking offense to something that's not even here? Because a lot of times that's what happens. Thirdly, check your pride. Now, before you say, I don't have any pride, it's not a pride issue. The Bible says to walk in love. They weren't walking in love. It's that simple. I'm just going to let them know. Ask yourself this. Am I seeking to address this matter to speak my mind and vent with no resolution? Or am I addressing this conflict for resolution and restoration? When we are so passionate about standing on our righteous principle, but we walk away from reconciliation, we have a pride issue. If we are not willing to address conflict with a resolution, we have a pride issue. Because if we're only addressing to get off our chest and defend our righteousness, there's pride. We can't walk away Amen. from restoration, reconciliation, and resolution. Amen. Now, if you've done those things, we're ready to address conflict. 
It's too many times we just go right into addressing conflict before we've done any of this, and it only leads to damaged relationships. Confusion, division, and what we mostly hear, church hurt, and we, run, we go out of fellowship. So, then how do we address conflict according to the word? Let's look at Matthew 18. Now, we'll talk about this today. And there's a reason we're talking about conflict within the body of Christ. Next week, we'll talk about um, what happens when we have conflict with someone who's an unbeliever. But there's a reason we're talking about conflict amongst each other first. Because this is where a lot of the conflict um, starts. You know, we have more grace for someone who's not a believer than we do for the body of Christ. So we need to deal with home first. So Matthew 18, Jesus is speaking, and he is telling you this is how he wants brothers and sisters in Christ to handle conflict amongst each other. Matthew 18, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation, and we're going to start with verse 15. It says, if another believer sins against you, another believer, so that's somebody who believes in Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is what we're supposed to do as believers. This is not something you're going to go hold a non-believer to. Okay, as Christians, we got a problem with we want to hold the standards of God to a non-believer. This is the standard amongst each other. If an, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Now, if you're like me, I hate conflict. I'd rather be quiet and not say anything and endure than engage. Well, over time, that doesn't work because you know what happens? Eventually, somebody blows up and the wrong thing comes out. When you're silent, we give permission for the same behavior to keep happening. And then you have no one to blame but yourself because you've chosen to say nothing. Now, that's assuming you've already done the other three things. You've prayed, you made sure you did your part, and you made sure there was no pride. And if you still have a legitimate concern, and you still chose to be quiet, you have no one to blame but yourself. But the key here is, you're to go to that person privately. Going to another person to point out an offense sometimes isn't the easiest thing to do, especially if they don't accept constructive criticism well. So a lot of times what we do is we try to Christianize it and go to another brother and sister in Christ and say, pray with me because I really have this issue with this person over here. Now what did we just do? We just engaged in gossiping. We didn't take the first step of going to our brother or sister privately not on social media, not to another person, not to your pastor or to another leader. A lot of times people will go to a pastor or a leader first. There's a time and a place for that, but that is not the first step. The first step is to that person in that person alone. And say Sister Jewel has a problem with me and she decides to go to Sister Erica. Now, by her going to Sister Erica, she has now put Sister Erica in the position to gossip when Sister Erica didn't even ask to be in a position to gossip. Now, out of Sister Erica's love and respect for Sister Jewel, she's going to sit and listen. But now she has caused Sister Erica to stumble because she placed her in a position to gossip. Now, let's take it a step further. In Proverbs 6, you can read it for yourself. Anyone who gossip has committed an abomination before the Lord. An abomination means to discuss. So when you gossip, you have discussed God. So by Sister Jewel going to Sister Erica to complain about something I did, she has now caused Sister Erica and herself to be disgusting before the Lord. All because she didn't come to me first. 
Now, whatever she told Sister Erica about me, now Sister Erica has a negative perspective about me. Do you see what discord that has caused? All because she didn't come to me first. All of that could be avoided if you go to your brother or sister privately first. And a lot of times, what we get upset over, we take offense over, or we think that there's something wrong. Pastor Laura used to say, before we get upset, let's get more information. Now, I used to not like that. Because I used to be like, some things we all need to get more information about. Some things are just what they are. We know what it is. We see it. But she was right most of the time. Because by the time we went and got more information, it was really nothing for us to fret over. Think about how many times have you sat up at night worried about something, and by the time you got the details, you realize it really wasn't what you thought. So if you just go to the source, you can eliminate all that. See, if we're not, in, if we're not ignorant of the enemy's devices, he doesn't win. Amen. But he likes to sow the discord and the confusion. And by you not believing the best of every person, see, if we believe the best of every person, if Sister Jewel believed the best of me, then she wouldn't think, how dare Timberly do that? Well, if she believed the best of me, that thought shouldn't even cross her mind. Amen. But because she didn't believe the best of me, she decided to go blabble off to Sister Erica, and now it created discord. Simply go to your brother or sister. Let's continue with verse 16. So say Sister Jewel had an issue with me. She came to me and I wasn't hearing her. Like, girl, please. I'm not hearing you. I didn't do that. But Sister Jewel still feels offended and really believes that I did something that wronged her. Verse 16. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. It's been said that a lot of people listen to respond instead of listening to understand. And sometimes, no matter how nice or loving you say it, they just don't want to see the errors of their ways. Right? Well, in those cases, what Jesus is saying here, if somebody truly has wronged and they're not saying it, then go take another brother or sister with you to help speak to them. So in this case, if I really did do something, then if Jewel was not successful, now it would be time for her to bring Sister Erica with her to come and speak to me, to help. Now let me give you an example of this. Let's say your son or daughter was doing drugs and you tried to intervene and you weren't successful. Are you going to give up? You wouldn't give up. Why? Because that's your son or daughter. So just because you went to your son or daughter once and they said, no, you're just not going to give up on them, right? You're going to go get another family member or a friend, someone to intervene. Worst case scenario, you may even have them go to rehab, like we've seen with some Hollywood stars, some successful, some not. Family members try, friends try, people in the close circle try, right? Right? Well, same with our spiritual family. If somebody is grossly sinning and offending us and we go to them and they don't hear us, we can't just sit back and be like, well, I told them once, so oh well. No, go get another brother or sister and go back to them. Amen. We're not going to let them just spiritually die, are we? But we do. We do. We say, I, I tried, I tried, that's on them. He says, if they don't listen, then go take a brother or sister and go try again. We don't give up. We have this backwards, and I want to show you that. Go look up to verse 12. I want to show you this. See, what happens is, when we get hurt, and I can only speak about us women because I know how we do. See, if Andre and I get into a fight, 
I ain't coming to him. He need to come to me. Y'all know how we do. He heard me. He need to come and apologize. I am not speak. I am not calling him today. He better pick up that phone and call me. He know what he did was wrong. That's what we do. So somebody hurts or offends us, we don't go to them. We wait for them to come to us because they hurt us. The kingdom of God works backwards. It don't work like how we work. So Matthew eighteen twelve, Jesus is speaking. He says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hill and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it over more than the other 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is, not, is it not my heavenly father's will that even none of these little ones should perish? See, the man left the 99 to go after the one. Which means we have to go after the one who, is, who did the hurting. We have to go after the one who did the offense. They're not going to come to us. We have to go to them. Secondly, he was willing to leave the ones who got it. And a lot of times we think, I don't have time to waste over here with the one who don't get it, I'm going to spend my time on the ones who do. Well, we have it backwards. The ones who get it already got it. The one who doesn't is the one who needs the help. So that's where we need to go and take more reinforcements because they don't get it. But in our natural mind, we think since they're in the wrong... We don't have time for this, so we're going to spend our time with the people over here who get it and leave this person out. This is where church hurt comes from because now not only did they sometimes cause an offense, now they feel isolated and leave. See, the church hurt is more twisted than we think. And a lot of times because we handle conflict amongst each other improperly. If there is a spirit of offense, we have to learn to come to each other for resolve. And if there isn't resolve, we have to push through it. There are a few ladies, I won't mention names, y'all already know who they are, Sister Jewel and Sister Erica, that I am in close relationship with. The Lord has caused me to disciple. And there are times where if I have seen a spiritual principle that isn't being applied, I will push. Sometimes it's not seen. I will push harder. It will cause conflict. I will push harder. It causes more conflict. I push harder. It gets ugly. I don't back up. Why? Because I love them. Did it make us separate our friendship? No. Maybe for like two seconds in that argument. But we're closer now for it. Because, it, and, they, and if they weren't getting it, I had to try another way. I had to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying because it wasn't worth me giving up because I saw that they weren't seeing it. So that's like what Jesus is saying. We have to keep trying until we can bring back to restoration. Because the ultimate goal is restoration and conflict. Otherwise, all it is is pride. We're demanding our righteous principle with no resolution. Now, he does give us some guidelines. Yes, we will leave the 99 for the one. But we're not a doormat. Because what if we do this and they still don't listen? What do we do next? We'll look at verse 17. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. 
I also tell you this, if two or three here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered as followers, I am there among them. If the person refuses to listen, tell it to the church. I want to help you understand this. I personally had to study this out for some clarity. Tell it to the church means to tell it to the pastors, an elder, someone on the pastoral team, somebody in leadership. Not necessarily the church congregation or just simply throwing someone out without resolution. But notice, this is the last step, not the first step. See, Jesus set the parameters. Go talk to them privately. Go take another brother and sister and try to win them over. Now, go tell leadership and try to win them over. Now, go tell it to the church has been taken literally. Go tell it to the church. And I've seen this happen personally myself. And it's not an easy thing to the person being placed on blast. And it's not an easy thing for the church either. So I've studied it out for my own clarity. Because I personally wasn't sure that I understood what was happening or agreed with what I saw happening. And from my understanding, if all scripture is to point to Christ, and since Christ is love... Public humiliation does not represent who God is and would not cause someone to repent for restoration in an offense. It would only cause them to more anger and revenge. So go tell it to the church is simply to tell it to somebody in leadership that can help bring somebody accountable. But I want to give you some insight on the church history regarding this passage to help you understand that. So, church history shows us that in Palestine, the average flock size was 100 sheep. Isn't that interesting? 100 sheep. And that's the same analogy that Jesus gave about the sheep. When the the shepherd left the 99 to get the one. And here we put so much emphasis on having these large congregations. When the average flock size was 100 in which the religious leaders who failed to care for their broken and powerless sheep were rejected by God. So think about that. If there was more than 100, how could the leader really care for the broken sheep if there were more than what that leader could handle? So if they failed out of the 100 they had, the Lord himself would go seek out that broken sheep. When there was conflict or sin among each other, the law and the regulation was to begin with private reproof as public shaming someone unnecessarily was considered sinful. So even back then, to publicly shame them without having witnesses was uh, considered sinful. Jewish teachers stressed the importance of receiving reproof. Deuteronomy 19.15 set the standard for two to three witnesses on accusing someone of a wrongdoing. Then we see here in Matthew that the same two or three witnesses that are the first one are the first ones to pray with the accused for repentance and restoration. So in Deuteronomy, when they set the guidelines that two or three witnesses need to um, be set forth to um, uh, to testify that the accused actually caused an offense, those same two or three witnesses are the very two that would pray for restoration for this person. So see, it's not about just addressing conflict. You're wrong, but it's about addressing conflict to bring them back to restoration with Christ. In Deuteronomy 25, they set the stand. Oh, let me back up. When the accused and the witnesses didn't come to an agreement, they were brought before the Lord, the priests, and the judge during that time. Deuteronomy 25 set the standard to go before the judge for a final warning before judgment and discipline. Now, the reason they were brought before the priests was because the church and the synagogues were not just for prayer and study. At that time, they were established as community centers for discipline. So during that time, the reason they were brought before the priests is because the churches did the disciplining for the community. That's not what happens in our modern time. 
in our modern time, judges, judge rooms, courtrooms, judges, they do the disciplining, not churches. So punishment during that time would take place in various forms, public beatings, dismissals from the community, and the most severe uh, would be treated like a pagan, and they would be removed from the religious community. So our role as a church in today's times is to hold each other accountable to the things of God. That is our role. So in these guidelines, when we go tell it to the church, we tell it to a pastor, an elder, someone on the pastoral team, somebody in leadership that will hold you accountable to the things of God. Once we've taken all those steps, that leader will hold you accountable to the things of God. Now the whole context about Matthew 18 regarding discipline and conflict within the body of Christ is mercy and forgiveness. Forgiveness qualifies, but it does not annul the force of the passage or the discipline of an unrepentant offender. So see, Jesus gave the guideline. We always, always, always want restoration. But if somebody refuses then we have to let them go for the sake of the whole. If they refuse. The ultimate goal is repentance and restoration. But if that doesn't happen, Jesus gave us instructions. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's public shame. So the timeless teaching, the standard that Jesus set here in Matthew 18, is that we follow the same principles of having two or three witnesses to lead somebody to restoration. We extend mercy prayer, restoration with warnings and a final warning from the church being pastor, elder, or leadership. But we always give the opportunity for restoration. And even if they are asked to leave, it is never for good. Always welcome back when they are at a place of repentance, turning away with true change and restoration. As church leaders and members, we should avoid causing people to stumble. We should avoid causing people to stumble. How do we avoid people cause how do we avoid causing people to stumble? That happens in our actions and our words. Our actions and our words cause people to hurt and cause people to take offense. And sometimes we respond in our flesh rather than through our spirit, which causes hurt and offense. Then we don't know how to handle that hurt and offense, which creates the conflict, which creates divided relationships, unbroken relationships, fallout, division, church hurt. Then how do we fix what we say and what we do? How do we overcome hurt? Those things we'll talk about next week. See, Christ told us how to address the conflict, but how we address the conflict is important. The way we address the conflict is just as important. Because you can come and tell me you have a problem with me, but the way you tell me will be all the difference if I want to talk to you again. (laughs) Can I get a witness? Right? This is a problem in the church. This is a problem in our homes. This is a problem with parents. This is a problem in relationships. um, A doctor told me this week, They're asking me a series of questions about how I was feeling. And I was like, no, no, I don't feel that. No, I don't feel that. And he said, are you sure? Or have you been coping with it for so long that you don't even realize that you've been feeling it? And I was like, you're right. Because I have been coping with the pain for so long that I don't even realize how long I've had the pain. Well, think about the relationships you have been coping with because you have not dealt with conflict. See, I don't like conflict, so I will deal. I will be quiet and endure disrespect, 
just to not have to deal with you. Because it will bring me anxiety. Like my heart will start to palpitate because I don't like that. Even when I know I'm right. But just because I don't want to deal with it, I'm not the confrontational one. You know, Pastor Andre, he's like, well, let's go. Let's deal with this head up. And I'm like, that's okay. I'll back down. But Pastor Lori had to work with me on how to deal with conflict and not to be afraid to deal with conflict, especially when I see a principle that's wrong that needs to be dealt with. That's not an easy thing to do. But when you learn to do it with love, and when we learn to address it the way Christ tells us to, then we avoid a whole lot of other problems. So we can't be afraid to address conflict. We first have to get over a lot of hurt. So next week, we're going to talk about overcoming hurt. How is it that we're supposed to talk and communicate in our behavior with one another and how we're not supposed to take so much, get offended so easily? And then it'll minimize the amount of conflict we have with each other. And then when we do have conflict and there is healthy conflict, then how do we deal with it? We have to deal with it. When we don't deal with it, it creates more problems. But when we can sit down and deal with it properly it will lead to deeper intimacy, healthier relationships. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.